Good. Now, when we talk about the utter gravity associated with the covenants in general, God's covenants, they're from God given to men, we're talking about you can't pass them by. Just like, mm -hmm. just like gravity doesn't pass anyone by or you can't escape it, there are things that God has said and put in place that men cannot ignore. If they do, it's, of course, to their peril. So we'll talk about those, those covenants and participation in them just in general, but specifically in the matter of the covenant given to Abraham regarding circumcision. But it, that, that in itself wasn't an end-all. See, it had to be looking forward to that which would be accomplished in Christ Jesus. Yes. So that, that's what will be opened up in this time that we have in the next several days. Now, you'll remember that God spoke several times with Abraham. Each time, mm -hmm. the promise became amplified in Abraham's understanding. Mm -hmm. And so, he didn't give him the covenant with, regarding circumcision the very first time he talked to him. And yet, he did give it to him because he could see that Abraham was one that was going to participate in what he was talking about. So, let's read from Genesis 17, beginning in, I'm going to start in verse 9. God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Okay. Now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stop right here. You can you can think about it in like that's a command and it is, but it's also a provision. Think of how it is in Christ Jesus. See, every every one in Christ Jesus shall be circumcised. Mm -hmm. words, there, he's gonna make a difference in them, and we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, mm -hmm. or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. Yeah. Yeah. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And then the alternative, and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised. Mm -hmm. That soul shall be cut off from his people. Yeah. He hath broken my covenant. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now you, let's just think of an example that demonstrates the utter gravity or the seriousness with which God wanted this to be kept. Not just to be made known, but to be kept by the people. You'll remember after Moses had left Egypt, spent the time in the desert tending the sheep, he had gathered during that time a wife, and some children, and now he had the word to go back to Egypt. This is in Exodus, I believe, 4. And we don't know all the details of this, but we see us utter seriousness. God, it says, God met him at the inn and sought to slay him. Mm -hmm. Now, was it talking about Moses or his son? Well, it doesn't matter. This is a serious situation. Mm -hmm. But his wife, Moses' wife, recognized that it was in regard to this matter that somehow this, it had been neglected mm -hmm. that the son be circumcised. Mm -hmm. So that was accomplished. And then he proceeded with the task set before him. Mm -hmm. See, so we, we see God is not leaving anything out in regard to the matter of the covenant that he has given to man. So the covenants presented in scriptural record, what they are, they're going to relay a statement, or what you could call it a promise of God, concerning a relationship with mankind. In other words, it's between God and men. But it's coming from God. Mm -hmm. He's telling them something. And he, is, he expects that there be a responsibility. Now, he's going to himself, God, have a responsibility in it. But he's also directing men to their response or responsibility in regard to the covenant. So, so there are times when it involves both parties. But we'll see that sometimes it, it's God that's actually making the covenant in a different way that men can enter into. I have four main points of understanding the covenants. These are my own. Uh, this is not like... An outline that you know is, is written in stone. This is just what I've come through in my explanation of this. For, firstly, I want us to note this: the direction from God unto men. It's a directional thing. This alone, the fact that the covenant comes from God, just that fact alone shows that the communication that He's making, and then the following things, the ramifications that are going to come from it, these things are undeniably important. Mm -hmm. If God's going to speak and He's going to tell men something. 
See, it's good for them to listen. Yeah, amen. They're designed also to call the recipient, like sometimes it was one, in this case Abraham, but it didn't stop with just one. It extended to recipient or even entire nations as Israel grew to rapt attention. They're to, they're to perk up. Mm -hmm. And they're designed to call them to this attention. And when this takes place, this attention and then compliance, what it's going to do is it's going to bring blessing and favor from God. That's mm -hmm. his intent. Mm -hmm. he did, he, in other words, he wanted to bless men. He's yeah. making them known how they can, making known to them how they can be a part of that blessing. He's their creator. See, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't create us just to ignore us and marginalize us. He has something he's going to accomplish in men. Alternatively, ignorement of that, of what God is saying, or even a, if, if, if people attend to it for a while and then like they depart from it, these kind of occasions will consign all the non-participants to judgment. And eventually, if they continue in that state, they'll actually be banished from the goodness of God. So there, there's only two responses to this. That's the first thing, the direction. The God, the man, the covenant. Secondly, though you can count, depending on how you read or who you listen to, as many as eight different covenants, and they can be identified. And I'm talking about like, he, he spoke in a different way to Adam than he did to Noah, than he did to Abraham, than he did to to David, see what I mean? He, he spoke to each of them in regard to a promise he was making. But what about the what about when God spoke to His Son, Christ Jesus? What about when He and the Word mm -hmm. were talking? See, so you see the covenants as they go, they're actually taking on a, a larger scope. Not because God is getting new ideas, but because men are understanding more about God in His communication to them. He's making Himself more known in, in revealing Himself. But anyway, as, as you can count. Six, seven, eight, whatever. But the Holy Spirit actually narrows the distinctives to two in Hebrews. It talks about one that's passing away and one that's going to remain. It's the old and the new for shorthand. Though most of the covenants presented rest upon a dual responsibility of God and men, the so-called new covenant, because it is, it is new, it's different, it's unique, surely. It's formatted. It's inaugurated, set in place, and then it's sustained entirely by the Godhead. Mm -hmm. See? And, and then men can just enter in. See how? Mm -hmm. See what a wonderful revelation this is that we live in this time. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. All the other covenants can, to some degree, be grouped under an old covenant classification, mm -hmm. but the new covenant is unique. Mm -hmm. The old covenant classification, the way that the other things can be grouped under it, is there's a conditionality that men have to maintain something. Mm -hmm. So they have to. God said, I'm going to do this, and you maintain this, mm -hmm. and then it'll, it'll work as an agreement of sorts. But see, the new covenant is different. It is brought to men, and then they enter in. Mm -hmm. Now, the new covenant certainly showcases the involvement of men and women. They're not left out. They do have things to do. They do believe in what God has said, and then that stirs them unto all kinds of good works and, and, and things that they're saying and doing that they didn't once say or do. Amen. This entering into the new covenant demonstrates though its efficacy. In other words, it works. Mm -hmm. It's good. God put it out and he didn't he didn't put it out like maybe men will take a hold of it or not. Mm -hmm. See it was already it was already men were actually formed and made so that they could actually enter in when he changed them. This is part of the image of God that was from the very beginning. But anyway this entering in demonstrates its perfection. Mm -hmm. It demonstrates that God is going to accomplish that which he began and set out to do. But it does not in any way, men do not in any way generate or perpetuate its success. God does. Mm -hmm. See, the salvation is of the Lord. That's mm -hmm. another way to say it. But there are people that are willing in the day of his power. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole working of the covenant. They are willing because of his mighty power. Not theirs. Amen. They are in full agreement, though, with his mind. We have the mind of Christ. And his ways. We desire to walk in the ways of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the difference. That, and, and we'll explore this more as time goes. But that's, that's the uniqueness of the new covenant. It's all of God. But men are all entered into it because God is active in it and continues to be so. Yeah. Thirdly, the strength and the wonders of the new covenant are due to its two covenanting parties. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's, again, my own term. But we're speaking here of God the Father 
and godly son. See, they were, they were the ones that implemented the new covenant. And the Spirit testifies his witness to it. See, he's yeah. active in this too. So in other words, the entire Godhead is working yeah. in the matter of this covenant to bring it mm -hmm. to that. Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49, I believe, both of them speak in this way. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. This, see, this is the Father speaking to the Son. Mm -hmm. He says, I will hold thine hand. Mm -hmm. I will keep thee. I will give thee for a covenant of the people, mm -hmm. for a light of the Gentiles. See, it's getting bigger already. Mm -hmm. In this sense, men are the booty promised to the Son upon faithful accomplishment of his responsibility. See, he has a responsibility. He's going to fulfill it to the glory of the Father. Mm -hmm. And also men are the reward. They're going to be rendered by the Son unto the Father for the equal faith, equally faithful accomplishment of his responsibility. He raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand. And see, then men are brought into that accomplishment, death and burial and resurrection. Lastly, or fourth anyway, the covenants were frequently endowed with a sign. Sometimes it's called a seal. Uh, there's something that is, that is uh, visible. In, now, in Abraham's case, it was visible to the, to the fleshly eye. Now it's visible by faith. But it's visible, yeah. one way or the other. But there's a sign or a seal of participation on the part of men in God's covenants. And, they, and again, they range, different things, different ones, different ways. But the sign is always designated by God. Men didn't come up with an idea to get together, well, let's go talk together and then let's talk to God and work something out. No, see, it's God designates the, the workings of the covenant and the sign that men have entered into it. So if they want to so be a part of it, they've got to come and receive from him. He is the originator. And the sign is going to represent not only the entry but the continuance in agreement with God. Just like with Abraham, remember he said, you and your household and your seed after you. So it didn't, it didn't just die off after one generation. It's a, it's a continuing work. Mm -hmm. The sign of circumcision given to Abraham and later extended to his seed, his seed after the flesh we're talking about, was such. It was such a sign. It graphically denoted a person or a people as, it, as they grew. They were keeping... It's an important word, keeping the covenant, mm -hmm. not just doing what God said, but they, in other words, this was a sign that they were keeping. They were retaining all the involvements of it. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were looking to see what God was going to do that he had already said. Why? So as not to be cut off or breaking it or ignoring it or excluding it. <clears throat> Due to the investor of the designated token that represented men's keeping of the covenant, God was justly impartial in his acceptance or rejection of them in regard to their compliance with that sign. In other words, he set it down. So now that he's set down the way that this thing works, if men enter in, good, they receive. If men do not, not good for them. But this is just of God because he's, see, he's already set the conditions. He's already set the sign. All men have to do is receive of it. So he's impartial. He, do, he doesn't make exceptions if you don't. He doesn't give you extra if you do. See, he's impartial because he's just and because he's, in, he's laid this out. Over time, then, it became apparent to men that, see, there, there was a flaw in this. The flaw was man. Yeah. <laughs> the flaw was mankind. Not, not God. It wasn't that he missed something. But what he's going to do, even in this with, with Abraham, he's going to demonstrate, as he did in the law. Remember, the circumcision was a part of the law. He's going to demonstrate that keeping of that on the surface was not the full intent. So it was possible, and often it was very visible, that such a, such a one that was circumcised in the flesh had no accompanying attitude in their heart. They, they, remember the ones they said, well, we're of Abraham's seed. And yet he, he pointed out who they were, who their father was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Abraham. Jesus did, is what I'm talking about. So this, this, these, are the, these are the thoughts as we launch our topic. And I know you, brethren, that are speaking will expand upon each mm -hmm. detail of these two to a great degree. We want to explore and to more finally have our understanding tuned over the next few hours tonight and then tomorrow and into Sunday concerning the need not... Now, again, we start at this point of talking about Abraham receiving the covenant of circumcision, but we're not doing a historical study. You know that. We're looking at, there's a more exact and exacting sign. In other words, it's more exact because God has something more in mind, and it's more exacting on you and me, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take more from you than just 
They're eight days old. What do they know? See? But see, those that are circumcised in the heart mm -hmm. by that which is accomplished by Christ, they know. Mm -hmm. See, they, they've entered in of their own desire and willingness. So the circumcision made with hands is excelled by the circumcision of Christ, the one without hands. This one is accomplished at the level to which God, the Father, and the Son, they have access, your inner man, the heart of man. Cutting off of fleshly tissue was received by many. It was received by many. They later gloried in the outward sign, but they ignored the gross overgrowth of sin on their heart. Mm -hmm. See? So there, there had to be something more that God was going to open up in regard to this. This is like a shadow of what was to come. The circumcision of Christ is not accomplished by ritual. It's not accomplished or it's not imposed upon one that may be too young, like eight days old. It's not, it's not uh, imposed upon men that are too dull to understand what it's really all about. Remember, like even in the Old Covenant, there was a time when they made, when uh, Jacob's sons or several of them made an agreement with the men of Shechem. Well, if you do this, you can be part of us. Mm -hmm. See, they, they were too dull to understand what this was all about. They were just looking for a, an out for what they wanted. But circumcision of Christ is not like this. Mm -hmm. It comes with an understanding of God and his work in, the, in Christ Jesus, his son. And it comes at a great price. It comes at the expense of our Savior being cut off from the land of the living. Amen. So he was cut off so that you didn't have to be, so that we don't have to be. It deals with the issue of sins being put away by Christ himself. This opens the way his work on the cross in, in, in being cut off and then cutting off the sins of, uh, taking away the sins of the world. See, this opened up a, a new and living way, Brother Pat. He opened the way for another operation called the removal of the body of the sins mm -hmm. of the flesh. One of, you, one of your brothers is going to speak on that. Mm -hmm. The sign of circumcision then stood for the covenant God made with Abraham. It was later implemented as a detail of the law in, in greater detail under Moses. It continued then on as a mark upon or in the flesh of a set apart people. Speaking particularly of Israel. Remember the great the, the two distinctions in the world were the Jews, or Israel, and the others, the other nations, or the circumcised and the uncircumcised. This was the distinction for many, many years until they were made one in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. See, that, that's, that's when the understanding was opened up concerning what all this time had had to do with. Abraham and his household received circumcision as a token, a token of their compliance with God and all the details of that covenant. As such, the sign represented a people that were able and they were willing to receive all of God's promises, but it was in regards to things of the earth. Mm -hmm. Possession of land, mm -hmm. reception of physical blessings. Remember they had the, the mountain of blessings and the mountain of cursing. See, receiving of that covenant was good and it was from God, but it didn't go, it didn't go far enough mm -hmm. in what God had in mind. So what, what this does, don't forget, Abraham believed God though. And when Amen. he believed God and received the sign, that was counted for righteousness while he was yet yep. in uncircumcision. Amen. So see, circumcision wasn't the big thing God was yeah. after. That's right. It was that Abraham would believe him. That's right. And he did. So this displays the, the superiority of faith as a sign of reception. Mm -hmm. See, the sign that we now have is we believe God. Mm -hmm. We believe that Christ has accomplished this in men. Mm -hmm. We believe in a covenant whose implication will stretch beyond earthly gain and favor. So we want something more than this earth Amen. can give. Even if God's Amen. given it on the earth, that's not enough. But God has a lot more than this. Amen. Abraham's faith was what convinced him to receive circumcision. And, as, and as, as he did in his household, then he continued on to participate in all the other commands that God gave. Remember, he, he had a thing with the, his son Isaac. He had a lot of other things that God asked him to do, but each time he responded in faith. Mm -hmm. So his faith was reckoned or counted, not his circumcision. It was his faith. Mm -hmm. The writer to Galatians, now remember those were the ones that are, were like in danger of reverting back to dependence upon part of what God had said and the matters of faith, but then they also wanted to implement these matters of the law, including circumcision. They had the, the Gentiles that were coming in. They told them, well, you have to be circumcised too. Mm -hmm. See, but the, Paul addressed this to, in the book of Galatians. They were wanting to depend upon the law's demands 
as a matter of justification and as a matter of favor with God. Mm -hmm. Galatians 5, 6 concludes, if they were to receive circumcision, he says, he says this way, neither uncircumcision nor circumcision avails anything. Now, is he going back on what he once said? No, he's pointing them higher. He's saying faith, which works by love. That's what avails before God. Mm -hmm. Galatians 4 and 5 have very strong warnings as Paul issues these to the ones in Galatia who held that circumcision after the flesh was like the touchstone. This was, if you had this, you had the point of validity with God. Your, mm -hmm. your salvation was good if you were circumcised later. That's what they were saying. But he gave an allegory there in chapter 4, the spirit, as Paul wrote, concerning the two covenants. He says the ones that are of this persuasion, they're actually linked with Hagar. Mm -hmm. They're linked with Ishmael. Yeah. These ones are indicative of slavery, bondage, entanglement. See? Mm -hmm. So that you, they and we, we want to flee this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Paul writes this way. He says, if you be circumcised, in other words, now, after, after you've believed, and now you've got to like, take a step back or two or three and be circumcised, he says, Christ will profit you nothing. That's right. Because you're not resting upon him. Your faith is resting upon something you did yeah. or was done to you. He speaks then of a mandatory addition to those of the Gentiles who would receive circumcision in the flesh after already having been beneficiaries of the circumcision mm -hmm. of Christ. In other words, coming to faith involved the cutting off of their sins, and now they were going to deal with something lower, which was after the flesh. Mm -hmm. They had already been identified with being buried with Christ, being buried into his death, and now they were going to step back. But see, th this is why Paul addresses these sort of things are still with us, brethren. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, the same gravity, or the same solemn, uh -huh. and unwavering adherence assigned to a shadow, circumcision, in the flesh, must, e must even more so yes. And in a more advanced fashion, accompany a circumcision by Christ. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, it's ratcheted up, as we say. See, we, we're paying more attention to this than the nation of Israel ever had to pay it to circumcision in the flesh. Mm -hmm. So those that trust in his name are the ones that are going to be circumcised by Christ. See, that has to do with him taking their sins. Mm -hmm. Any persuasion short of this would signal what Paul called falling from grace. Amen. Grace Amen. is what brings this matter to men. Uh -huh. See, he had mercy upon them, and then he issued grace to them that this would be cut off from them. Mm -hmm. he, he did a work on them, mm -hmm. in them, and continues to. But they and we would not deny the sufficiency of Christ's work. Mm -hmm. See? Why the shift? Why the demotion of the priority of fleshly circumcision? Well, it's like all the other aspects of the Old and New Covenant the former must give way to the greater reality. Amen. When, when the old is seen for what it is, see, then the new is, there's no question that it's better and that it's mm -hmm. of a higher value because God brought it in. Better things become fruitful in the man that he's appointed, Christ Jesus. So when anything Christ does is brought to the forefront, see, everything else has to just step way back and fade away. The Amen. absolute necessity for circumcision was not lifted, but it was shifted. See, it was shifted now, it was shown to be of an internal nature. It was doing what outer circumcision could not or ever was expected to do. Uh -huh. It was to cut off the callousness of sin. Mm -hmm. Sin encroached upon the heart and the conscience of men. And God dealt with this through Christ Jesus. Yeah. The body of sin is destroyed, Romans 6, putting an abrupt halt to its growth. Amen. Putting a halt to its prominent natural state. Mm -hmm. It's been cut off. And, and we continue in this. We continue to recognize the work that he has done. And we continue to, to, to put away the body of the sins of the flesh. But see, Christ has accomplished this. Mm -hmm. Believing in that and, and, and holding, uh, what was that word we used before? Keeping? Mm -hmm. see, keeping this in, our, in the forefront of our understanding. Mm -hmm. The body of sin that is destroyed. So the absolute necessity of this work in order for men to be received by God is perceived and is accomplished by Christ the Son. Mm -hmm. I want to want to make one note too. Back in the illustration that we began with, with Moses and the Lord meeting him and seeking to sleep, slay him in the inn, in the way. Well, I think Moses had two sons. And I think their names are mentioned, but they're not written up prominently. Mm -hmm. But see the necessity of everyone in that household? 
See, this had been this was not a matter of the law yet, mm -hmm. but it had been given to Abraham way back. Mm -hmm. So it was passed down verbally. Mm -hmm. Those in God's household were keeping this. Mm -hmm. So this demonstrates now, now let's bring it up to the present. Look at the importance of each and every one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, it doesn't exclude, it's not just for the ones that are out front, let's say. Mm -hmm. See, it's not just for the ones that 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 seem to be known more. This has to do with everyone in Christ Jesus. God has accomplished a work in them, or Christ has. Amen. He has, a, he has mm -hmm. cut off the body of the sins of their flesh. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. We have opportunity after each uh, speaker for any of you brethren to respond, and we'll go ahead and take that time now. Amen.